how's it going everybody? I am uh, Clint Smith. I'm a 2020 Emerson Fellow and the author of How the Word is Passed. And welcome, thank you for joining the New America Fellows Program and the Center for the Future of War for the discussion of Jonathan Katz, Gangsters of Capitalism, Smedley Butler, The Marines and the Making and Breaking of America's Empire. Uh, before we start, a few housekeeping notes. If you have questions during the event, please submit them through the Q&A function and we will make sure to get to them in the second half of the event. Uh, and most importantly, most importantly, copies of Gangsters of Capitalism is available for purchase through our book selling partner, Solid State Books. You can find a link to buy the book on this page. Just click buy the book at the bottom. And I say this, and I'm gonna say this at the beginning because sometimes in this virtual space, people can like click on it and they'll open a tab and they'll be like, oh, I'll get to it. And you've got 7,000 tabs on your computer and then your computer crashes and you never get a chance to buy the book that you meant to. Do it right now, click on it, buy the book, buy seven of them, buy them for to stack on, you know, under your computer for your Zooms, buy them for your coffee table, buy them to show that you are a thoughtful interrogator of the larger American imperial project and in putting it in conversation with the world around us today. Uh, but most importantly, buy it because it's an excellent book. I'm so excited to get into this conversation with Jonathan. Uh, who, if you are not familiar with, uh, you should get familiar with. Jonathan Katz, Jonathan M. Katz, is a 2019 ASU Future of War Fellow at New America. He received the James Folly Medill Medal for Courage in Journalism for his reporting from Haiti. His first book, The Big Truck That Went By, was shortlisted for the Penn John Kenneth Galbraith Award for nonfiction and won the Overseas Press, Long, Overseas Press Club's Cornelius Fryan Award, the J. Anthony Lucas Work in Progress Award and the WOLA Duke, Award, Duke Book Award for Human Rights in Latin America. His work appears in the New York Times, Foreign Policy and elsewhere. Katz also received a fellowship from the Logan Nonfiction Program. He lives with his wife and daughter in Charlottesville, Virginia. Jonathan, how are you doing, man? How's the virtual book tour been so far? It's been virtually great. Virtually great, that's, <laughs> that's uh, spot on. Um, so, I mean, we're going to hop right into it. These hours fly by. First of all, how did you decide to make uh, Smedley Butler the sort of central character or protagonist around um, this book? Because this is, you know, in, in many ways, this is a book about U.S. imperialism, and you could have taken a myriad of different approaches, uh, but you kind of used a, a, a certain person, a certain character, someone who I wasn't familiar with as the uh, as our guide almost through the history of American imperialism. Um, and I thought that that was such a fascinating and effective strategy. Uh, and I'm curious if, if that's how you imagined it from the beginning, where did you kind of stumble on him or were you gonna write a biography of Smedley Butler and then just it morphed into something else? I'm, I'm curious of sort of the evolution of the, the process. It kind of, uh, well, first of all, by the way, thank you for doing this. Uh, uh, this is this is terrific, and I'm I've been very excited about putting uh, our books in conversation because you obviously wrote an incredible one. Um, yeah, so I mean, to a certain extent, uh, and maybe I'm remembering it wrong, but this idea sort of like kind of almost popped out of my head, fully formed at once. Um, you know, the I first encountered Smedley Butler while I was writing my first book, The Big Truck. The I had come across his name shortly after moving to Haiti, um, I think on Wikipedia, like in an article about the banana wars. Um, and uh, I then, after the earthquake in 2010, I was writing the big truck and I knew I, I wanted to sort of, you know, go back into history and explain how things had gotten so precarious. And that required talking about the U.S. occupation of Haiti. And Butler is a major character in that occupation. And for that book, you know, I was looking, and maybe this is like partially a, a, an out of order answer to, to your question about the way that I think about my process. But like, you know, even at that moment, I was thinking like, well, if I'm going to tell the story character to drive the narrative forward. Um, and I didn't end up using any of the material that I collected on him. Uh, it was a very brief amount in, in, in the process of writing that book. Um, but the thing about Butler that made him so it, it, I was sort of a, fascinated by both questions simultaneously. The question of, uh, you know, how did, how has America's imperial past been remembered by the rest of the world, but is completely ignored and, and in many, many cases actively suppressed in memory hold in the United States? 
And who was Smedley Butler? Uh, Butler, uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm not just saying this like to, to sell books. I'm explaining like how I got into it. Like Butler is Butler is the, one of the most fascinating characters that I had ever encountered. He, you know, he was everywhere. You know, he was Zelig. He was in every you know U.S. Uh, invasion, occupation, uh, 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 overseas war from 1898 until the eve of, of the Second World War. And then at the end of his life, he becomes a anti-war, anti-imperialist critic. And so part of it was just like, I was like, well, how did this guy, how did this person who was known literally as the devil in Haiti, how did he become this anti-war later in life? And then this sort of merged seamlessly, as I remember it, maybe I'm misremembering, but I'm talking about memory, uh, uh, from the beginning uh, with this question of, you know, and why, why is this person who was so famous back then and why were these wars that were such a big deal back then? Why why are none of them talked about today? Which then created an opportunity to like you know write a whole book about it. Um, so that was that that you know I, you know I'm sure there was maybe more conversations sort of at the beginning, but as I remember the conversation with my agent was that I want to write this book about Smedley Butler, but I don't want it to be a biography of Smedley Butler. I want it to be a, a history of American imperialism. And then I want it to have this modern day component uh, where I you know, travel to the places and use sort of my skills as a, as a foreign correspondent to talk about uh, uh, the ways in which, you know, that story is, you know, reverberates today. Um, and that it was sort of a process of me trying to convince her and then trying to convince the publisher that this kind of, you know, cockamamie idea was, was, was a good one. I mean, it's so interesting because, I mean, as you say, like, he was everywhere. I mean, it's, it's almost kind of like if you were going to write, if you were going to, if I was going to write a screenplay, you know, like making up a character, I, you know, if I read this, I'd be like, okay, but like, was this person really at like every single imperial project that the United States engaged? I mean, it felt, I mean, he was in the Philippines, he was in Haiti, he was in China, he was in uh, I think Mexico, he was in all these different places. Um, and, and it just, I mean, it kind of, sometimes I think when you're writing nonfiction, the, the characters end up being better than the fictionalized versions that you would have come up with. And, and Smedley Butler to me seems like one of those characters who just serves as, um, again, this like really remarkable guide through the, so many of the sort of atrocities that the U.S. has enacted or have been a part of over the past several decades. And one of the other things you do, and you alluded to this, is not only is it is he serving as the, the our guide, you're also serving as our guide, right? And you, there's a version of this book that could have been written from your office, right? That could have been written from the library, um, that could have taken so much of the incredible history and archives that you delved into, uh, so many of the incredible primary source documents you spent time with, and, and written what still would have been a, a really great book. Uh, but I think what makes this book different and what takes it to the next level and something that I really resonate with a lot because um, it's very similar to how I did my book. We were talking before um, the, the, uh, the webinar started about how there's a TikTok um, out there that has the book, um, how, to, how to Make an Empire or How to Build an Empire. How to Hide an Empire. Yeah. How to Hide an Empire. Mm -hmm. And then my book, How the Word is Passed. And it's like, if this book and this book had a baby together, it would be, and then they show this book. Um, and after reading the book, I was like, that's so funny because we really had similar approaches where it's this idea like you have to go to the place where this history happened uh, because it gives you a different sense of that history, right? To be on the soil, to be in the buildings, to be with the people who are the descendants of those who experienced these atrocities. How did you come to decide that you wanted to travel, truly travel across the world to go to all of these different places. And why did that feel important to you? So the first thing was that I was, you know, so it was, it was, it was maybe a combination of motivations. One was, you know, I'm a reporter, like it's what I do. Um, I, I play historian and I kind of, I, I played historian uh, for years while I was writing this book because I spent a lot of time in the archives. Um, but my wife, Claire Payton, Dr. Claire Payton, like she's the historian. And, you know, and, and, you know, so part of it was I can bring, you know, 
interpretive analyses. I can bring, you know, I can do you know, play with different frameworks and I can sort of do some of the work that a historian does. But what I really do is I'm a reporter. Like I go places and I talk to people. So that was part of it. Another part was um, that, and this actually, you know, as I, as, as I'm remembering this, um, big shout out to new America, seriously, because like this book was really born out of sort of like my new America journey, like my new America process. Um, the first time that I actually even said the words out loud, uh, I think I'm going to do a book about Snuddly Butler, uh, was it's like an info session. And he's like, so what's your project? And I was like, what is my project? I was like, have you ever heard of this guy, Smedley Butler? Cause it was like a name that had just, you know, a, a, a concept that had been kicking around in my head for, for a while at that point. And it was in conversations, um, uh, especially with uh, a friend of mine uh, through New America named Chris Leonard, who's, who was a fellow and, and uh, on board for a long time. Um, uh, we were talking about, so part of my concern was that even though this period really isn't that long ago, uh, the period that, you know, Butler's fighting in, you know, 1898 to, to, to 1940, mm -hmm. um, it's really not that long ago. Like people are still alive who were alive during it. Um, but I was worried that maybe it would feel remote, um, that some of, you know, some of the terms, some of the history would maybe feel a little stodgy. And I wanted to, you know, make sure that that didn't happen. And Chris actually put me on to a book um, by Tony Horowitz mm. called Blue Latitudes, um, which was uh, about uh, the journeys of, of uh, Captain Cook. And in that book, uh, Tony Horowitz, I mean, this is also a thing that Tony Horowitz does in other places, but in that book in particular, Horowitz and a friend actually go to the islands in the South Pacific in Australia, and I guess New Zealand, which is also an island in the South Pacific, um, where Cook went, and they sort of, and he intersperses, um, you know, the, you know, entries from, you know, Cook's journals and like, you know, historical, like, you know, research on that period with like, here I am in Tuvalu and like, I'm passing a billboard and it looks like this. And part of me, you know, so part of the reason that, that I, I, I really want to do this was I was afraid that Butler, you know, as, as, as many places as he had been might end up being like kind of Character who would feel out of remove, among other things. One of the only things that I knew about him at the beginning was he was a Quaker from Philadelphia, and he, throughout his life, wrote in his letters to his parents and his wife. Um, he would use like thee and thy, uh, which he, so even though he's you know writing letters like this in the 1930s, like it, it you know I was af afraid that that could feel a little like out of date. Yeah. Imagine my surprise when I actually got into, uh, and I was also worried that maybe there just wouldn't be that much material on like what he actually was doing like in these battles like what the battles looked like i then as i'm you know i've i've gotten um i'm embarking on this research um and i'm sitting at uh, the first place that i was doing archival research at quantico um through butler's letters and they just and and they're just you know wheeling out cart after cart after cart of his letters and his letters are are voluminous. I mean, they're just, he goes on and in detail and he's like bearing his heart and he's talking about his like toothaches and like what he what he had for breakfast and why it wasn't his preferred thing before he kills people. I mean, it's like, and I was like, and he's, and he's, I mean, he's funny. Mm. He is complicated he's terrible like he like you know his like his racism is like awful and there's all these like parts of him and i was like and, and i didn't i didn't anticipate that at the beginning and so you know the way in which he ends up sort of coming alive on the page in his own tellings and his own just sort of like characterfulness um and then, you know, since I had already, since I was already, you know, fully committed to, to, to doing the modern day thing, I was like, you know, I, I had to, part of, part of the writing process was trying to figure out, and this was also something that happened at New America in, hence uh, writing workshops, was trying to figure out like, how do I balance like this just character who jumps off the page in the historical material and, you know, me going places 
Um, and that was a real negotiation about, you know, turning up the levels on this and turning them down on this uh, and, and trying to make it all work together. So, so the, the very short answer is that like, it was almost, it was at the beginning, I thought it was going to be born out of necessity. Um, and then it ended up, I, I, I think being just sort of something that, that added to, to what was already, as you, as you note, a great narrative on its own. Absolutely. Um, pivoting to the, the specific content of the book, one of the things that you talk about early in the book, and that was so, that was really illuminating for me. So for folks who don't know, um, my own book is a book about the, how the history of slavery is remembered or, or misremembered um, across the United States and, and to some extent abroad. And so I've been thinking, you know, a lot about the founding fathers, been thinking a lot about, you know, went to Monticello, went to Mount Pelier, went to Mount Vernon, um, think about uh, what those places represent and who those, what the, idea, the sort of way that those people, those men and their ideas served as the foundation upon which um, not only American, obviously domestic policy, but um, international policy would be built. And one of the things that you uh, brought up was how Jefferson wrote a letter to Madison suggesting that they should um, annex Florida, Canada, and Cuba. And he says, we should have such an empire for liberty as she has never surveyed since the creation. And I thought that that was so illuminating. Um, and I thought, and, and I'm thinking too about how uh, for enslavers, they wanted to um, annex Cuba so that they would have a place to tip the balance of power so that they could have more control over Congress and the US government. And it really demonstrates this early relationship between slavery and cap uh, uh, between slavery and imperialism. Mm -hmm. um, and you talk about how so many of the people who were, you know, and this is the founding fathers, but even so many of the people who were the leaders of the Confederacy, or the former leaders of the Confederacy, um, and who were in charge of these sort of early uh, Jim, you know, in charge of the Confederacy and the, and the early Jim Crow um, governments were also the people who were going abroad and enacting the policies um, that were destabilizing these regions in the global south often uh, across the world. So yeah. can you talk a little bit about the relationship between sort of domestic manifestations of oppression through slavery, through Jim Crow, through uh, indigenous genocide, whatever the case may be, and, and the sort of almost what feels like a, an outgrowth of those sensibilities um, in the way that people, some of those folks enacted and destabilize region, different regions across across the world. Yeah, no, that's those are all really good points. The, I mean, in you know, so as you note, like before the Civil War, um, you know, one of the major drivers of of the quest for expansion of the United States was slavery. It was to have more slave states, more land to expand slavery to, um, and and you know, so there's slavery capitalism and expansionism were kind of, you know, the, the, the two, the, the three legs of, of, of the stool. Um, and uh, yeah. And so, you know, Cuba is initially looked at very hungrily by uh, Jefferson Davis as secretary of war. He under Franklin Pierce, he uh, is, is uh, pushing to, to annex Cuba. Um, Paul considers it. Uh, and at various points along the way, um, there are there are proposals to annex Cuba, to annex uh, uh, Santo Domingo, what becomes the Dominican Republic, um, and those are sort of rejected by sort of like America, like white Americans' racism. Like <laughs> it's like it's like the it's like the the scene in The Simpsons where where it's like Mr. Burns is uh, uh, like disease profile and all the diseases are trying to fit through the door at, at once. And and uh, and Dr. Hibbert's like, if you move, remove one of them, they'll all come through, but they're all sort of keeping each other in check. It was kind of like that because, um, yeah, I mean, like, uh, you know, a, a successive president, Millard Fillmore, uh, came to this conclusion. Uh, uh, James Polk came to this conclusion. They were like, well, we could annex Cuba, but don't speak our language. They're Catholic, um, and and you know, and and the ratio of 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 black people to white people, of enslaved people to to uh, to Europeans, was was such that they were afraid that it, you know that it would it would have these sort of other effects on American life and on the American body politic that they didn't want. 
And what happens in the period of the book that that I'm, you know, th that where the action is really set, um, uh, with you know, so the book the book opens with uh, the war against Spain in, in 1898, and Smedley Butler joining the Marines. He lies about his age years old, and he joins the Marines uh, to go fight in Cuba and, and ends up at the, the first place the Americans uh, uh, conquer in Cuba, a, a little spot called Guantanamo Bay. Um, and by that moment, you know, so the Civil War has now happened, uh, you know, uh, uh, three decades before, and it is, but the Civil, the, and the Civil War just like suffuses this entire period in every respect, both, um, you know, Teddy Roosevelt and sort of the jingos, uh, the the as they're known, like the the, the expansionists, the imperialists, um, desire to sort of reclaim the glory of their father's generation. They've missed out on, um, you know, they they grown up hearing you know tales of heroism in the Civil War and they hadn't gotten to participate in it, um, and then also this sort of relationship between slavery and expansionism, because at this point, obviously, uh, slavery has. Uh, been outlawed in the United States. It's also been outlawed in Cuba, finally, over the course of 30 years of, of uh, independence war by the Cubans against their Spanish colonizers. Um, and because slavery is a dead letter in the United States, the, the, the people who were themselves former enslavers or the children of former enslavers um, are no longer in Cuba anymore. In Cuba to, you know, tip the balance of power in, in Congress, that's old hat. And so for them, the only thing that's retained is this other idea that like, you know, they speak Spanish, they're Catholic, they're not white. Their idea, like Spanish categories of race are different than, Ameri than American categories of race. You know, they don't subscribe to the one drop rule. So there are some people who don't consider themselves black, who would very much be black in the United States and, and they don't want it. And so you have guys like um, one of just the all time, great SOBs in American history, uh, uh, P uh, Ben Tillman, Pitchfork Ben Tillman, um, the, 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 the one-eyed, not that having one eye makes him a bad person, but it just sort of adds the, the picture of this guy. The one-eyed, uh, you know, he was a Confederate. He enlisted in the Confederate Army, um, and he then becomes governor of South Carolina. He oversees a huge surge in lynchings, and he gives this passionate uh, opposition to specifically the colonization of the Philippines um, on on the floor of of the Senate, where he he says you know you know uh, uh, you know incorporating the Philippines in the United States would bring in and then he lists all the different categories and subcategories of non-white people yeah. that he's that he's worried and he's like. He's saying, like, I, like, I don't want to be sitting next to, to the senator from Malay. Like, that's not, that's not my, that's not my vision of myself in America. And what ends up happening at this moment is the other thing that's happening. Um, and and uh, uh, you know, I I, I draw on on um, uh, the work of uh, Adrian uh, Len Smith, uh, who writes a great book called Freedom Struggles about this period, um, and and others. Um, you know, this is this moment of. Uh, reconciliation between sort of Northern capital and Southern capital, Northern whites and Southern whites. Um, you know, we're in the redemption. I mean, 1898 is also Plessy versus Ferguson. This is all, it's also the, the, the year of the Wilmington coup. So like all of these things are sort of happening at once. And, you know, basically white people in the North are like, well, let's, let's sort of, let's, let's find, you know, common ground with, with white people in, in the South at the expense of both non-white black people in the United States and elsewhere. And this, you know, comes, in, you know, this is lived out on the ground in these wars. And there's also, in addition to, you know, Plessy, there's a series of Supreme Court cases known as the insular case, um, which are still good law. They still govern life in, in Puerto Rico and Guam, et cetera, um, which say that just because the United States government runs your island and just because the flag flies over your you know, territorial house does not mean that you have equal rights under the Constitution. And this is still in 2022. This is still the law that, that governs Puerto Rico it's, it's, and, and Guam and, and the Northern Mariana Islands, et cetera. It's still the law. Uh, it's, there's still the cases under which it is acceptable for us to have these 
fully owned colonies that do not have a vote for president and do not have representation on the floor of, of either house of Congress. And it's that compromise that ends up mollifying people like pitchfork Ben Tillman, where he's like, well, if they're not going to have representation in Congress and they're not going to be able to vote for president and we're not going to have to give them equal rights, I guess that's cool with me. Right. And it, it, that provided such helpful historical context for me, right? And it just really made the through line clear of the uh, sort of colonial inequity um, and the, the way that electoral agency has been stripped from these places that are ostensibly members of the sort of larger American project in, in, uh, and, you know, making it clear that, I mean, it, it's just so revealing because it's, you know, you see all these parallels between what's happening abroad and what's happening here where they're like, oh, okay, well, if, if black people can't vote or if black people don't have, you know, can't run for office or if black people you know, if I don't have to sit next to them in the restaurant or if I, you know, and it's a similar sort of sensibility that are animating the decisions about how, what the United States relationship to its uh, colonial territories will be, uh, depending on the nature of, of who they are. And I, I mean, I remember the part in your book about the Philippines where the, maybe it was like one of the generals or a politician and they were using some of the same, they were using like anti-black language about yeah. Filipinos because they, they almost like didn't have the language like anti-Asian or anti-Pacific Islander language to use, but they were like, well, they're brown. And so they just started using these anti-black racial slurs to describe the Filipino folks. Um, and again, it just, it just makes that through line so clear. And one, you know, this is tied to that. One of the things I didn't know, I just learned so many facts from your book but like, I didn't know that the majority of people who built the Panama Canal, for example, were, were black people who had been brought in from the West Indies. And one of the things you talk about is how the United States, both in Panama, but also more broadly, were, was like, Americans were exporting restaurants and they were exporting, you know, goods and services and certain things that um, came to these regions and like came to Panama but they were also exporting American apartheid, right? Like, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think you describe it as such, you were like, they, they were exporting the very racial hierarchy uh, that, was, that existed in the United States uh, and then bringing it to, uh, to Panama and bringing it to places where, as you mentioned, the relationship of race, like what the sort of racial hierarchy looked different Right? Yeah, like race yeah. doesn't look the same in Panama as it does here. Race doesn't look the same in Brazil as it does here. Race doesn't look the same in Honduras as it does here. Um, but, but part of what the US did was impose its own conception of uh, what it believed the racial hierarchy should be. And that animated what, um, what life in these places looked like and, and, and really shifted um, in some ways the dynamics of of race relations and racial dynamics um, in these places. I, I think I remember in the Panama chapter, you were talking about the, um, the struggle between, you know, cause these were black West Indians brought in from, brought in to Panama who spoke English. And then uh, they, their relationship to the sort of the native and indigenous communities in Panama who spoke Spanish, that yeah. was contentious, but all of that was happening because white people from America were the ones who were bringing in Pan like um, bringing in English speaking West Indians to I mean and, and the whole yeah. thing it's like I mean we it gave me such a more expansive understanding of of what of how the U.S. destabilizes these regions. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and one of the things that I you know I wanted to make sure, and it was a, a lens that, that that I brought to the book was that you know it is not. In no way, in, in, in almost in no areas of the book at all, is it just, you know, the bad U.S. doing things to, you know, blank slates. Like, these are people with agency themselves. They have, they have their own histories uh, and their own complexities. And race, is, race and, and racism is, is one of them. So, yeah, in, um, uh, in Panama, um, I, you know, I, I, I spend a little bit of the book um, talking about uh, the, you know, and this was something that I would not have gotten just from reading. Maybe if I'd read 
enough, maybe who knows, but like I got it in a much more visceral way by going to Panama and spending time. Um, the ways in which you know race in Panama is extremely complex because not only do you have you know sort of the and and in the period that I'm talking about you know the Zonians who are essentially like the white uh, American mostly white American colonizers who live in in the canal zone, um, uh, and then you also have the you know you have the indigenous Panamanians you have the the, the Panamanians who you know are mestizo with you know mix mixes between you know European and indigenous and maybe some African ancestors. In Black Ma, there's the, there's the fight between the Afrocoloniales, who are the descendants of the original uh, or the older, I guess I should say, uh, uh, immigration forced immigration of enslaved Africans by the Spanish, mm -hmm. and then the West Indians, the Afroantilianos, who are the descendants of the uh, mostly uh, Barbadans, St. Lucians, uh, Grenadans, mostly from the, the, the Lesser Antilles, who the Americans brought in to, to dig the canal and die for us, for, for our benefit. And the, and the way the visceral sense of this was that I, you know, I, in Panama City, I went to, um, there's a museum, uh, and I talk about it in the book, uh, called the, the Museo Afro Antiliano, the the the, the Afro Antil Afro West Indian Museum of Panama, which is which you know contains a history that is not even reflected in the the more well visited uh, museums of the Panama Canal that you know most tourists go to, um, and it just so happened. I mean, this is the this, like like you know this, and like there's a million moments like this in in how the word is passed as well. It's just like magic that happens like you're just there so i just I, I go so i go to the museum i introduce myself to you know a, a, a woman who is is uh you know on duty that day i'm the only person in the museum and you know i'm like you know i'm writing a book you know i, I you know and she's like oh you know well we have a like we have a library and i'll go down and i'll introduce you and uh it's there that i uh, encounter you know this bound volume of letters from the West Indian canal workers, all of which are almost all of which are written in English. Some of them are in Spanish, um, and uh, and I'm reading that. It's like table, like you know, covered in like uh, like you know, it's like a, got a vinyl cover over the, the tablecloth, which is how you know you're really in like a, you know, like in a Panamanian uh, uh, archive, uh, somebody's house basically, um, and. Uh, and all, and the, and the door opens and these women come in and it's the meeting of the friends of the museum. Mm. And they're like, oh, well, you got to stay. Yeah. And so I'm in this meeting and I hang out and it's, it's this woman, uh, Ines, uh, Ines Seeley's birthday. It's I think her 80th birthday. Uh, and they sing her happy birthday and they have cake and ice cream. And then I get to know her. And actually, I don't I, like, there, you know, there's so many things that I did that I don't have time for in the book. I actually end up spending like a, like a day with Enos. She's awesome. And like we, she she decides like she's like there's a there's a, a Smithsonian Museum uh, in in Panama, like another remnant of of uh uh, American colonialism. It's like it's like a a wildlife center that like has like it's like they have like frogs and like sort of like native animals and it's really interesting. And she's like, we should go to that. And so like I'm like walking around, um, you know, with Enos mm. and 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 she's you know looking at and she's and she's talking about you know her mother from St. Lucia and her father from Barbados. And you know them coming to Panama and the and the double and triple racism that they experienced, mm. both from the lighter skinned Panamanians and from the, the white Americans, and then also from the Afro coloniales. Mm. Um, and then I go, you know, I go to Cologne, which is you know, uh, and and I and I you know I have lunch with um, uh, Mar Marcia Rodriguez, who is an Afro colonial who's whose grandmother told her stories of the American invasion in which Smedley Butler took part in 1903. Um, and it's, and it's just, you, you know, and all of these are just, they're all wonderful women and I would love to go back and, and hang out with them again. Honestly, they're awesome, especially, well, they're both cool. But, um, but uh, uh, I, 
you know, it was just, you know, it's, and it's, it's exactly as you say, I mean, you know, I, I talk about in the book, the way that, you know, the, the Americans who build the, build the canal zone uh, around, you know, within which the, the, the West Indian workers, uh, for the most part, do the actual uh, building of the canal. And they bring Jim Crow, like they bring, uh, they bring this system uh, in which they divide the payroll. It's the gold and silver system. And you have essentially white people and, and white American citizens um, are on the gold roll. And so they're, they're paid at a higher rate and they, uh, uh, they get you know, better housing, they get better commissary, et cetera. They have their own separate entrances. And then you have the people on the silver roll who are almost entirely black. Um, there are these interesting marginal cases where like, like worker, like white workers from Spain are like fighting and they're trying to figure out like which role do they go on. But, um, and, and yeah, and, and this was, this was promoted by the Americans who are overseeing this uh, as a mark of modernity. Like this, they, they sell this as a, as a public health uh, uh, innovation where they're like, we're bringing this great American innovation of segregation which is going to somehow like keep people from getting malaria. It makes no sense, but like, the, but, but, but they, 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 they build this as a mark of progress. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Panamanians had, had their own uh, ideas about, you know, racial categorization and their own ways of living within what becomes the canal zone, which by the way, that's another thing that I didn't realize. I mean, I had heard about the building of the Panama canal, but, guess was that this was an area that was was depopulated this was an area that people lived like there were tens of thousands of people who were evicted from their homes forci forcibly by the americans for the purpose of, of building the canal and one of the ways in which uh uh you know dr gorgas um one of the ways in which the the, the americans who are 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 uh overseeing this ethnic cleansing essentially uh, were just forced just total you know uh, population uh, removal from uh, the canal zone um, is that they're saying like, well, look how backward these people are. Like they weren't even segregated. Like they weren't even, like there were, there were light-skinned and dark-skinned people like living next to each other. Like these people clearly don't know how to create a society. We're doing them a favor. And that was the way, that was one of the ways in which uh, uh, Americans in that period uh, told themselves that everything that they were doing was okay. Man, it's just, it's always wild to think about the way that <clears throat> systems of white supremacy and, and oppressions more broadly um, attempt to justify themselves. I'm curious from your end, also I should say, um, as we are getting closer toward the end, we're about two thirds through, uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the Q&A function. I will certainly incorporate your questions as we finish our conversation. Um, so feel free to throw those in there. <clears throat> and if you have not pressed purchase this book button, press it now. Do it now. Don't wait another minute. Uh, I'm curious for you. I mean, you you went to all these different places. <clears throat> I mean, I I just again I could this whole thing could just be me like going through my list of all the things that I learned from your book, like the, that uh, U.S. imperialism in Honduras is related as, and its relationship to banana exports, and then you talk about how that is one of the ways that the term banana republic came to exist. And it was one of those moments, I think I was like eating a dole banana and I was like, oh snap, you know? I was, I was like, oh my, my God. And I was like, what am I doing? It you're was eating a banana, you're eating I, a banana by the former standard fruit company on whose behalf Smedley Butler and the Marines intervened oh in Honduras God. in 1903. And I I'm, I'm have a question about that, but I'm gonna do it closer toward the end. Um, but one thing I'm just curious, just generally for you, like which place that you went was most I don't know if the word's surprising, but like the place that you, that is, that has stayed with you the most, you know, maybe it's, that was most surprising, that was most, you know, that resonated the most, that, um, that devastated you the most, or that you learned the most, like what, what is the, you know, if you can pick, I know it's like picking your kids, it's hard, exactly. but like, exactly. which, which one is the one that you are like, this is, this, I couldn't have written the book and not included this chapter. So I want to stipulate first off that like Haiti, you know, 
uh, I, I lived in Haiti, you know, for, for, for three and a half years. Um, a lot of my heart is, is, is still there. Um, and, you know, and, and Haiti is, Haiti is also the, the height of Smelly Butler's career. Um, and, you know, you know, so, you know, there's two chapters on Haiti. There's one on the Dominican Republic, um, uh, which also deals with sort of the Dominican, Re Dominican Republic's relationship with Haiti. I also lived in the Dominican Republic before I lived in Haiti. So there's, there's, you know, the, the three, the three Hispaniola chapters, um, sort of geographically, they're, they're at the center of, they're literally the center of, of, of the book. Um, and they really are sort of at the heart of how I, how I came to this story um, and, and the lens through which I view it. I mean, you know, one of the, one of the, and I, I talk about him in, in uh, the, the prologue to the book. Um, and the prologue is broadly about a, you know, Smedley Butler blowing the whistle on this, you know, fascist coup in, in the 1930s, which I, I could and often do find myself spending all day talking about. Um, but, uh, uh, but I also am talking about, and I, I quote, the great Haitian scholar, Michelle Roth Trio. you know, uh, uh, his book, Silencing the Past, which was one of sort of my lodestars. Um, and also, by the way, the epigraph to this book is a Haitian proverb. By Coublier, Poté Marc Songer, the one who gives the blow. I, it was my translation, deals. Uh, I was trying mm -hmm. to be a little bit cute with, with Gangsters of Capitalism. The one who deals the blow um, uh, uh, forgets, the one who buries the, bears the scar remembers. Mm -hmm. um, you know what? I'll just say that because it's. It, I guess. I guess. I, I just throw cleared myself into into just making that my answer. I mean, you know, I I, I go. I I um, uh, you know, I I I knew that I was going to have to go back to Haiti. Um, you know, for, uh, uh, to write this book. Um, I I went back at a period of uh, extreme unrest. It, there, it, it, Haiti is now in, in in yet another one. Um, and, you know, I go with my with my dear friend, uh, Evan Sanon, um, who, if anybody here has read uh, the big truck that went by, will know Evans very well. He was my fixer and is is my um, he's he's my he's 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 my he's my friend. <laughs> and he's he's he's, you know, it's the guy who I go through the earthquake with and, and, and he's throughout the big truck um and he does you know he does make a a an extended cameo in in um in the in the haiti chapter of this book because i go and i meet evans um in in cap in, in the north uh and then we go into the mountains to look for um the place where smedley butler won his second of two medals of honor um in in the massacre at fort rivier and i you know go up this mountain looking for him and end up in a in a voodoo temple etc um uh you know but you know, but but Haiti is Haiti. You know, it it, it will surprise nobody <laughs> who knows me just to say that like Haiti. You know, um, uh, you know, it it just comes through and 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 uh, you know another part of the book that 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 you know uh, was ultimately sort of one of the first parts that I I reported was on a, a, another trip to Haiti. Um, I you know I visit this uh, industrial park that essentially the Clintons built um, in, in response to the earthquake. Um, a, a, an industrial park, which unbeknownst to the Clintons and unbeknownst to the builders of the park, um, was a forced labor camp uh, overseen by the Marines, including Smedley Butler, mm -hmm. um, in which not only, so, so Smedley Butler, among other things that he does in Haiti, a, a country founded famously in a... In Uh, national uh, re revolt by enslaved people against uh, their, their, their enslavers, against France from uh, 1791 to 1804. Smedley Butler then reimposes slavery in Haiti um, for the purpose of building roads for the occupation. And, and this is one of the forced labor camps. And at this forced labor camp, um, a, a great Haitian hero of the resistance against the Americans, Charlemagne Perrault, um, is he's killed by the Marines he is, and he is buried in this place where the Americans uh, in, in uh, the mid 2010s building a garment factory complex. And, and I go there and I meet, um, you know, I'm, 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 
you know, I, I'm on a tour of this factory. I kind of escaped the tour. And then, you know, I speak Creole. So like, I, I'm just asking people, I was like, you know, you know, <laughs> could, could, could like, where, where did, where is Charlemagne Peral? Where, where was he buried? Cause I know he's, his, his grave had been moved by that point. And, and I go there and, and I'm like, you know, like at this grave site and I'm, I'm talking to, to, um, uh, a guy, I think his name is uh, Anis Jean, and he's, you know, and I'm explaining to him, you know, in Creole, like, I'm like, you know, I'm writing this book about uh, Charlemagne Perrault and, and this period in, in American history, uh, because Americans don't know about it. Mm. And he becomes incredulous. He's like, I don't believe, like, fuck with so like, I don't believe you. Like, how, how could Americans not know about this? Like, that's impossible. Um, and so that, you know, that was, um, you know, that was, my answer was going to be the Philippines, but I, I ended up, <laughs> I ended up throw clearing myself into Haiti as, as often happens. But Haiti, Haiti makes a lot of sense. Um, somebody's one asking, uh, and you alluded to this a little bit, but maybe you can go into some more detail. Is there anything that you left on the cutting room floor, um, that you wish you had been able to include? Oh man, so much. <laughs> There's so many things. Um, I actually have a, an op-ed coming out. Um, I think I think this afternoon, uh, um, and uh, and it, it contains a, a a little bit of of material uh, from from Haiti from a a, a, a joint attack uh, by the Marines and and um, uh, the gendarmes, which were uh, uh, the the client militia that, that Butler creates, which becomes the model for a, a whole. Uh, 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 lineage of client armies uh, that go that include the, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam uh, mm -hmm. for people who remember the Vietnam War up through the, the Afghan National Security Forces, um, and uh, uh, so so that was a piece that that uh, it's 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 it it, it 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 it's basically a piece of writing from essentially you know 1919 that could get ripped out of a story about a drone strike today. Mm -hmm. uh, but I found a home for that in, in this uh, op-ed that's going to be coming out, I think maybe in a couple hours. Um, but there's so many things. I mean, I'm, you know, uh, you know, I, I wish I could have included that, that trip to the, to the frog museum with Ines C yeah. Seeley. Um, uh, you know, I mean, you know, uh, you know, I, I, you know, as, as anyone who's written a book, like, you know, I wrote, I don't know how many books I wrote <laughs> that I, that I, that I had to, you know, cut out. Um, there are just so many incredible moments, you know, and Butler is just this, he's this fascinating character, um, you know, and there, there were some things that, you know, I was able to, you know, sort of work in like a little bit of, um, uh, you know, I have a scene, it's like kind of a partial scene uh, where during Butler's anti-war phase um, in 1935, he appears at a, an event in Cleveland uh, and it's, it's sort of thrown, the, the event is kind of put on by like the communist party, but like, they're not all communists who are involved in it. And it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, a protest against war and against fascism. Mm -hmm. And it's Butler, um, uh, a, 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 a an important anti-fascist from uh, Cleveland, Langston Hughes. Um, all appear on this stage together along with other people. And there's other people who I'm like leaving out of this brief telling. And um, just like what, so, and there's a Marine spy who comes to this meeting and reports back to the commandant what's happening at this meeting. And, and he's there to sort of inform on Butler. Um, but he writes about, he writes all this stuff about Langston Hughes. Um, and he, and, and um, one of the things that he says is, that um, this this Hughes guy must be a communist spy because he speaks far too eloquently to have written these things on his own. So they must have been written for him by CPUSA. Clearly, um, clearly. clearly. And so, and, and 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 then you know, and then you know, I have I like I was able to sort of go down this rabbit hole and like figure out a little bit. You know, there's some, there's some you know there's some uh, interaction between Butler and, and Langston Hughes, uh, which obviously, you know, it doesn't need to be said, but puts the lie to that particular uh, 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 insult. Anyway, so like, you know, there, but there was just, there were so many things, uh, you know, it was, it was, this book was five years in the making. Um, I could, I could write, I could, I could write a whole series, honestly. I don't think I will, but I, but I could. Well, I hope that there are more of these op-eds um, 
that are coming. I know the feeling of the cutting room floor and looking down at it and being like, damn, that's like three other books. Yeah. Um, so, so I feel you on that. One of the things that I kept thinking about uh, as I was reading, and, and this might be the last question, um, mm -hmm. is like, what is it, what does it mean to live ethically as an American given this history? Like if we look around us, our, you know, I was kind of making light of it earlier, but like our fruit, our clothes, our houses, you know, the material that, that makes our cars, our, you know, all this stuff to varying degrees are material manifestations of a history of violence and oppression and imperialism. Um, you know, whether it's the things that, that, you know, the people who were killed, uh, you know, essentially killed in, uh, to make the Panama Canal that so much of our stuff comes through, whether it's the bananas in Honduras, whether it's the, you know, the beef in uh, Mexico, whether, you know, whatever the case may be. What, what, what do you think about what, like what do, you know, just what are the, how do we live ethically given this history and the ways that all of us, even when we try ostensibly benefit from the material resources that have been extracted as a result of yeah. this past. Yeah, I mean, um, and it's all done, you know, because we're an empire, it's all done with sort of a flick of the wrist. Another moment that that I remember from this just sort of coming back to me right now that that, that um, that I remember from my travels that I, I couldn't include was I, at, at the fancier museum, El Museo del Canal, the, the, the Museum of the Panama Canal in, in Panama City. Um, you know, I had to get sort of a special escort in order to be able to like take photos for my notes. And while I was going around this museum, um, the, the, the guy who's, who's escorting me like asks like, you know, so what do Americans think about the fact that the Panama Canal was given back to us in, in, in 1999? Um, you know, uh, are they still mad about it? And I was like, I don't know how to tell you this. Most Americans don't even know that we had it at this point. Mm -hmm. Like it's not because we got, every, because we, we wrung everything out of it. And, and at the cost of all these lives and, and all, and, and, and all these things in Panama. And there's still, I mean, they, they are still very much living today. I mean, the canal, uh, uh, but, but um, you know, with, with all these legacies of American imperialism and, you know, like, I don't know, like, I don't think that like the fact that I had that conversation with him, like makes me like, you know, an, an inherently ethical person, mm. I, you know, I think it's a really, really hard question to answer. And honestly, I think it's a question that Smedley Butler was, was dealing with in his life. I mean, one of the, one of the reasons why I, one of the reasons why he is such a fascinating character um, that, you know, that I've spent, you know, the last seven years essentially like living in my head with, um, is because at the end of his life, he recants his imperial past. Mm -hmm. He writes the series of articles, he writes Wars a Racket, and then he writes the series of articles, uh, in a socialist magazine where he says, you know, I, I participated in the raping of, of half a dozen Central American republics. I made China safe for standard oil. I, you know, um, uh, made, you know, Haiti and Cuba a, a, a good place for this, the Citibank boys, Citibank still exists, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to collect revenues in. Uh, looking back on it, uh, I, I could have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he did was operate in three city districts. We Marines in three continents. Mm -hmm. And the ultimate tragedy of his life, and maybe this is the ultimate tragedy of, of our lives, is that he ultimately belatedly sees this imperfectly. He never really, he never really deals with his, his uh, you know, racism. He never really deals with, with his intersections of, of uh, you know, uh, masculinity and, and white supremacy. But he does see to a far greater extent than you know, almost any other Marine does at, at his time or most any other person does, really. Um, he sees the way in which these things that he did that, gr that brought him so much honor and fame and glory have you know, these, these destructive effects, not only on the rest of the world, but on ourselves here at home, all, you know, on, you know, these ways in which 
uh, as as uh, Ame Cesaire says, you know, uh, that that, you know, the, one of the ultimate uh, uh, consequences of colonialism is the brutalization of the colonizer, um, which then comes back home in the form of fascism um, and, 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 and brutality at home. Um, you know, ultimately, Butler, he, in, in, you know, he's a great success as an imperialist. He's really a failure at, you know, any kind of attempt at anti-war or, or, or anti-colonialism. Mm -hmm. um, he, you know, he, he, he spends his last stores of energy trying to prevent World War II from happening and trying to prevent the United States from getting involved in it. Um, and, and, to, and to convince Americans to, you know, uh, decolonize our, our, our holdings, especially in, in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And it's only with World War II that the Philippines, which three chapters of this book that, that Butler, you know, spends so much time in, um, that, that the Philippines are finally granted their belated independence after we have bombed them to death. Mm. Um, to a certain extent for, for Douglas MacArthur's ego so that he can, so that he can make good on his promise, you know, I, I shall return and then, and then return to Manila, which becomes the second worst uh, destroyed city in the world after Warsaw um, in, 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 um, uh, in, in, in World War II. And, and Butler's trying to prevent that from happening, and he fails. And to a great extent, he has failed to do so because he was such an active participant in creating this empire and creating these in, imperial structures. Mm. And, you know, the, and, and really, you know, I mean, and, and I think this is the thing that, that you deal with in your work as well, like, you know, ultimately, this kind of of individuals versus structures you know like how much how much of an impact can any one person have versus you know the, these larger historical and and social structures and the answer is it depends it depends on where that individual is placed an individual president can have much more influence than 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 uh, you know a uh, an unhoused person, you know, who's, who's just watching all these things go by. Um, to a certain extent, it has to do with the ways, you know, the extent to which we are participating in sort of the goals of these structures in, in making things worse. You can have much, much more effect then. Um, if you are trying to make a war happen with Russia right now, you are going to be much more successful um, than, than, than if you, than if you, you know, if you try to fight against it, unless you're one of the people who might have influence on this, um, who, who can stop, you know, the war machine as it goes into overdrive. Um, and so, you know, maybe the answer is, you know, uh, maybe the answer is that, that it is impossible to be, <laughs> to ultimately be, be, be truly ethical and still be, you know, inside, uh, you know, maybe it's impossible to, to, you know, Dismantle the house using the master's tools, right? Um, uh, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe that's the answer. It is, you know, it it is more ethical to try. It is more ethical to try to uh, shine a light on these things and 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 uplift um, uh, the people who 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 are 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 trying to point out these crimes and and to and to prevent further ones from happening. Um, people like Osmat Khan, our, our new America colleague, who has done yeah. just incredible work. Um, and, um, I, in, in the op-ed that I have, I, I'm, I'm, I'm tying sort of Butler and to, to her work actually. Mm. Um, but, um, uh, but, you know, at the, at the same time, it's like my daughter needs bananas, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, to extricate yourself from it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's. It's hard. It's really hard. And, and, you know, you know, maybe, maybe the answer, I, this is, I feel like this is the Jewish, like the Talmudic answer. It's, it's, it's like, it's the argument. It's the struggle. Like it's, 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 yeah, it's exactly. being in the fight that like, where, 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 you know, where it's as much as you can do. Yeah. Um, but it's also, you know, Looking at the ways in which, in which uh, you, you, looking at the ways in which you're perpetuating the, the empire, and, and the ways in which you're trying to dismantle it, and, and and trying to make the best choices you can. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right, um, and I think that so much of the point of educating yourself and struggling with it and reflecting on it, and you know, books like yours that teach us so much about it, 
um, are so that we don't do the same thing in the future, right? And, and I think that that is, um, that makes the struggle, you know, meaningful. Um, so Jonathan, man, it's an excellent book. Um, congratulations. Uh, I, I know virtual tours and virtual, situ you know, the situation can be weird. I hope you get a chance to do some in-person stuff, um, at least a few sometime soon. Uh, but uh, hope your daughter and your family are doing well. Hope she's loving those bananas as much as my she kids does. are. She does. Um, <laughs> and thank you all. Thank you to everybody who joined us over your lunch break, uh, or if you're on the West Coast, when you, your breakfast break. Um, appreciate you coming through. Again, buy this book. You won't regret it. Um, it's really, really excellent. And uh, if you're into audiobooks, you can get the audiobook, whatever, whatever your thing is. Um, Jonathan, thank you. New America, thank you.